Good afternoon and welcome. Thanks for joining us on the first of 18 Agile Shift presentations this month. I'd like to kick it off by simply saying a big thank you to all of the partners that helped make this uh, happen. NRG, BP, FlightAware, Scrum.org. Um, definitely couldn't have pulled this all together without them. And to the army of people that you won't hear speaking, you won't see on video, that help make this happen, my sincerest gratitude. So for everybody that's that's not attended a, a Teams live event in the past, I'd like to kind of point your attention to the Q&A portion on the panel inside the web browser that you're using or the Teams client you're using. Anytime during this conversation, please feel free. Go ahead and put in some questions there as they come up. Um, Michael Slater is producing this for us and he's going to be uh, at certain points in the conversation, adding those questions so that this can be collaborative as we continue to explore. And if you haven't had a chance, definitely check out the other speakers. It's going to be a great month and I'm really excited that we'll be able to kind of continue in that learning and growth. So I'm Devlin Lyles. This is just about everything you need to know about me. Um, the president of Improving Houston and we'll be kicking it off today wanted to touch on something that is often not talked about when it comes to agile adoptions and it's going to be a bit of a kind of evolution as we look through things talking about the personal and career impact of agile adoptions and digital transformations because they they have a significant impact on how we approach our day-to-day -day work they change how we interact with each other with our business and with the work that we've built a great amount of expertise in. And so that can cause fear and trepidation. So we're going to be dispelling some of the myths that surround the agile and digital transformation space, looking at the evolution of the work involved over the last 40 years and making sure that take a look at the impact on the complexity of the work we're doing today. And then we're going to talk about how personally we can meet the challenge of the changing world that we're in and adjust ourselves so that we don't see any negative career impact. And then we'll wrap up by talking about the way that organizations are impacted by these moves and how organizational structure, career growth, progression and change management can really be shaped to eliminate a lot of the human um, trouble and angst and, and problems that are caused in this space by just being a little bit more proactive. So let's dive right in. So the first thing I want to talk about is a couple of myths. Now these myths make good headlines and they're really great at drawing people's attention and getting you to click on a link and go read an article. The first one being all of our jobs are at risk of being automated um, or at least a significant portion of it. Um, the thing is that this doesn't actually pan out to reality. Um, when I look at things like uh, automation of the ATM machine and how that had an impact on bank tellers or automatic weaving machines and how that had an impact on, on tailors and clothers, we see a different story, which builds into the kind of big myth that agile and technology will remove the need for my job, that my job is at risk simply because we're going in this agile space or we're moving digital. Um, when weaving machines were introduced, uh, it actually drastically reduced the labor requirements for creating a bolt of cloth. Um, and so you saw a 97% reduction in the needs for labor for weavers. Uh, and everybody assumed that this was going to be a huge impact to to the textiles uh, manufacturing space and that there was going to be massive unemployment. And we actually saw the exact opposite. It quadrupled textile jobs in just the span of a few decades. Now, the way it did that was because it shifted the bottleneck of a system. By automating the weaving process, cloth became cheap. When cloth became cheap, clothing became cheaper. People started buying more clothing which actually created a huge demand for pattern makers and seamstresses and tailors. And so it quadrupled the 
workforce in that space, but also increase the average wage because there was a better profit margin because we had these cheap cloth to work with. If I look at the 1980s and I explore what happened with ATMs, right? We saw ATM machines increase by 12 fold the number of ATMs between 1980 and 2000. In that same time, we doubled the number of bank tellers. So it wasn't that ATMs were entirely replacing bank tellers, but what it allowed us to do was to have neighborhood branches because the, the labor cost for a specific bank branch was, was lower. And so we had more branches to bring convenience to the consumer, which actually netted us more tellers employed and hundreds of thousands of more ATMs in the market. And so automation only has a negative impact on jobs when it doesn't cause a corollary increase in value creation for other jobs that are related to it. Similar to how jobs that used a computer when you know the personal computer was brought into the workspace actually grew faster than jobs that didn't. Even kind of re uh, repetitious jobs and the things that you would think could be easily automated we simply were able to do more with less, right? When we talk about manufacturing reducing in the United States, that's a number of jobs count. We've actually doubled our manufacturing output with half the number of manufacturing jobs. We're four times more productive than we previously were. And so you start seeing this myth kind of come and go inside the, the automation and digital and agile space is that we have Agile teams, so we don't need managers anymore. Well, we have Agile teams, so we don't need BAs anymore. Oh, we have Agile teams, so we don't need testers anymore. And those just flatly aren't true. And so we're going to just eliminate those myths straight out the box because the faster you build software, the more you need requirements gathering to stay ahead of the, the machine that you've created in that software development team, right? The more software you're producing and delivering, the more testing you need to make sure that you can do that rapidly. So it actually increases the need for some of those roles. Now, if we talk about the evolution of work, kind of moving past the, past the myths, let's talk about where we came in the last 40 years and how this has, has really shaped our perspective on the modern career in whether it's project management, complex knowledge work, or even software development. So in software development, we saw a skills evolution. In the 1980s, you could know kind of a single language and you were hired. It was easy. In the 90s, it shifted a little bit. You typically have kind of your one primary language and you might also know a database language, um, right? I might know PL SQL, and then I'd use Fox Pro in the front end or something similar. And that was pretty career stable, right? In the 2000s, you had to kind of know a language and a set of frameworks, um, Java and EJB, those kind of things. You know, oh yeah, you know C Sharp and .NET, awesome. Um, and then the 2010s kind of came around and we saw this, this pull in the market towards broader skill sets, uh, the T-shaped person that we talk about. You know, they've got broad knowledge of sufficient depth to be proficient, but then they have expertise. And so that's where you get, oh, you're a full stack, you know, developer with some messaging experience. And that was no longer enough to guarantee a job because what we had seen in this was that we started commoditizing software development a little bit and we saw negative unemployment for the first time in IT. And we, we really started to see this kind of talent war almost. In the 2020s, we're looking at, oh, I need to know five UI frameworks. I need to know Angular. I need to know React. I need to know Vue. I need to know Ember, right? I need to know three different backend languages because I might be in C Sharp or Java or Node. And I need to know how to store data in Oracle or SQL or Mongo or Azure storage. And we start feeling this rat race almost. We feel like the skills we are gathering and building that take years to do so effectively 
are almost obsolete before we're done building them. And it's really a perception thing based on the front of the market moving, not necessarily a reality of the adoption curve inside the net inside the market where things like Angular might not be in vogue at the moment, but there's still massive numbers of applications, enterprise applications, small startup shops, mid-sized shops that have built on that platform and will continue to do so for years to come. Now, this isn't just a software development problem. If we look at the 1980s and kind of the burgeoning of the, the PMO idea coming out of the defense systems programs, um, it really was that, oh, you've, you've done systems program management in the military, fantastic, right? And in the 90s, we started seeing this explosion of certifications from IPMA to PRINCE2 to the PMI, right? And then 2000s, oh, you've got your PMP and you're good with Microsoft Planner or, um, sorry, Microsoft Project um, or some other technology in which you could do this more rapidly. You could support multiple teams. And that was enough to kind of solidify the career. But then in the 2010 space, it was, oh yeah, you need your PMP and you need an Agile certification, you know, professional scrum master or your ACP or your CSM, right? And now we're looking at it of, oh, are you these four levels of safe certified? Do you have these five PS certifications from scrum.org and you have your PMP and a decade of experience across multiple industries. Because the complexity of the work that we're, we're dealing with has grown, the tools have become more specialized. Meaning that I can't take my general frameworks from the 1980s idea that I can write everything I need to do in one language and I can use one program management style. Now we're far more tailored to what we're working on. I bring the right language. I bring the right UI framework. I bring the right project and portfolio management methodology for the specific need. We've gotten to this best in breed, which has kind of fractured the market. And that's caused a significant amount of consternation because I no longer feel like I can build one set of skills and I can bank on that set of skills until I retire the way that my father and my grandfather could. And so we start looking at this kind of evolution of complexity in our work, and it, it paints a pretty scary space because it means that we're gonna have to constantly be learning and growing as we go. Now, previously, that, that was a minor thing and people would learn and grow over time, but because business has sped up and the problems we've, we're solving have sped up, that cycle has become compressed and so without deliberate attention, it becomes a problem. When I say that it's become compressed, let's take a look at it. Now, one of my favorite websites is Information is Beautiful. That's actually where I got this. They are brilliant. You should check them out. Um, but they did an analysis of code bases. Uh, so based on number of lines of code, and you'll notice the top scale here starts at 100,000, um, and then it moves down to the 1 million uh, lines of code is about 18,000 printed pages. Um, and so you see some of the original things like Unix 1, right, was 10, 15,000 lines of code. Photoshop 1 was barely 100,000 lines of code. But there are massive increases, right? Photoshop to CS6 grew by 3,700%. The Linux kernel continued to grow, and it would grow by hundreds of percentages. Now, keep in mind, we're talking only in this a shift of about a decade. And it keeps going. Now, this is the most recent segments where we're looking at things from 2013, 2015, 2012, uh, and we're seeing this big explosion. So if my com if the complexity of the work that I'm tackling is increasing at an ever increasing pace. And I'm going to have to keep up with that over the course of a 40 or 50 year career. What does that mean for us? Well, it means that we can't take the kind of traditional hierarchical ladder approach to our career. It means that the idea that 
I would go to college. I'd get hired out of college. I'd work somewhere for five to eight years and then get promoted to a lead, another five to eight years, get promoted to a manager, another five to eight years, promoted to director, another five to eight years, maybe if I'm lucky VP. And at this point, I've spent 25 to 40 years at one company. It is unfortunately not a reality that we live with the way that we lived with it in the 40s, 50s and 60s. And so when we have to adjust to this new reality, we have to start viewing our career not as a progression of seniority or tenure, but an investment. So if I were to evaluate my career as an investment, am I putting in the effort? Am I seeding it in the right spaces is a big deal. Now, I'm a big fan of career capital. Now, career capital was a, a, a term coined in so good they can't ignore you. Um, and it's really been a kind of evolutionary idea inside the business space. But it's anything that puts you in a better position to make a difference in the future, including skills, connections, network, credentials, a nest egg or a runway. Gaining career capital is incredibly important throughout your career. But as almost every investment advisor out there will tell you, it's especially important when you're young because it compounds over time. So are you putting in the effort to continue to grow in the network, the credentials, the skills growth, those kind of things? But then are you diversifying? Are you spreading that growth or are you doubling down on being a pure technical person? Is it purely job expertise in the one thing you do that's going to be a much higher risk strategy than spreading that growth across multiple different avenues that could potentially allow you to shift and pivot over time because those skills no longer translate directly onto a ladder it's more like a rock wall and so if i look at it and i go all right i want to move over here a little bit there's going to be risk, but there's also going to be reward. There's a fast way to go up the wall. There's a slower way. I could go horizontal for a little while if I wanted to try something new. Um, I might even go down a little bit and move over just so that I can change roles and those kind of things. And it's it's less prescriptively linear than it was in the past. So in this kind of amorphous and less linear career path, how do we approach this? So the first piece is, don't wish it was easier, wish you were better. Now in 2007, Steve Martin was on the Charlie Rose show talking about his memoirs, and he got asked, you know, what advice would you give for aspiring performers? And his response was, nobody ever takes my advice because it's the answer they don't want to hear. They want to hear, here's how you get an agent, here's how you write a script, here's how you but I always tell them, be so good they can't ignore you. Now, Cal Newport, the assistant professor of computer science at Georgetown, became intrigued by that notion and set out to find how do I do that? And one of the concepts, concepts that he, he hit on was career capital, right? the skills that are both rare and valuable. If I want a job that is both lucrative and enjoyable, I would consider personally that to be rare and valuable. That means I need to bring something that's rare and valuable to the table, right? That's supply and demand 101. If I don't have something is equally valuable to offer, probably not going to get that job. That doesn't mean that I have to be the best at something, but it means that my combination of investments over time should allow me to make that offer and return to the employer because I'm getting something significant out of it. I'm getting something that I enjoy. I'm getting a, a role that I dearly love and I'm getting well compensated. But it all falls down to, we have to do these little things. Um, I'm a big fan of the McRaven quote, right? If you can't do the little things right, you'll probably never be able to do the big things right. Um, T.E. Lawrence summed this up pretty well. He said, all people dream, but not equally. Those who dream in the night 
in the dusty recesses, recesses of their mind, wake in the day to find that it was vanity. But dreamers of the day are dangerous. They can act on their dreams with open eyes and make them possible. So if we were to take this career and this fear and this uncertainty that, that comes around an ever shifting climate, how do we dream with our eyes open? What investments do we make in our career that would make the biggest difference over time? Now, one of these is time and attention management. And I absolutely am a big fan of this. So I've got my time and attention management book right here. And it's got my day. It's got all the stuff that I'm planning on doing. But it's also got my goals for the day. It's got what energy levels I was feeling in the morning. What focus level I was feeling. Now, that's important to me because if I'm low focus, I'm probably going to move that really critical accounting review to the afternoon so that I can kind of build through it. If I'm high energy, I'm going to probably want to work on my creative work rather than throw my head into an Excel spreadsheet. So it's not only managing how I'm spending my time, but also how I'm spending my attention. Am I giving time and attention to something that is not going to build career capital for me towards the goal that I want to achieve? Do I want to spend my time writing another C Sharp programming book when I haven't written software for our clients in years? Or do I want to spend my time learning and growing around business management and conscious capitalism and philosophy and those kind of things that will affect how I show up to the people I lead? Those are very different ways to spend time and attention. And you only have a certain amount of time and attention to spend. Are you spending it well and building out a program that allows you to do that? My personal, I'm a big fan of Code and Quill's Habit Planner. I used to be a Franklin Planner fan. Whatever that system is, though, use it effectively. Use it consistently. And then the other one is communication. Not everyone is going to be big into public speaking. Not everybody is going to give a live stream or an in-person conference talk to hundreds of people. You don't have to. But right, wrong, or indifferent, your productivity, your value to an organization, the perception of your intellect and the results that you produce in your job are based on how you communicate them. It's based on the language you choose. Do your emails have typos constantly? Um, do you use lots of filler words? Do you avoid eye contact? And there are great ways to practice these things, whether that's through uh, Toastmasters, there's a technology specific tech masters. Um, there's a bunch of different tips and tricks that you can look. There's YouTube practice videos where you literally post a video on a private YouTube channel and then watch yourself present so that you can gain that feedback. But building communication skills, written and in person, is incredibly valuable to the growth of almost any career. The more and more we automate, the more and more we move into the digital space, the more people value human connection and being able to listen actively and empathetically and then respond is a big part of those communication skills. Are you investing in that space? Are you good at collaboration? For the longest time in my career, I wasn't. I was bad at it. I wanted to be the heads down, headphones on, software dev with my big clickety keyboard. And I realized that it was making problems harder to solve. And so in seeking to solve the big problems, I got more and more collaborative until I realized that I actually enjoyed the collaborative problems more than the technical problems. Are you practicing that? Are you seeking feedback from your team on better ways you could collaborate? Are your retrospectives just, we're gonna sit down and talk about what everybody did wrong, but then not get better? Or are we gonna push ourselves outside the comfort zone and actively trying to get better at one thing over two weeks can make a huge difference. Now this one, this next one is near and dear to my heart. 
learning and self-investment. Now you're doing some of that right now. If you're watching this video after the fact or you're part of the live stream right now, thank you. I've been doing this one somewhat religiously uh, since very early on in my career. I was, I was fortunate enough to have some great mentors in my life. And Jay Smith, Rob Tennyson, Mike Pitts, I owe a lot to those guys because they instilled the idea that I should spend five hours, it's the five hour rule, five hours a week in personal growth, in building my skills, sharpening the ax is what they used to call it, um, so that I never fell behind, that I didn't watch my market value and my career value disintegrate. And one of the, the coolest pieces that I got taught in doing that is I would, I would absorb a ton of content and I would take monstrous amounts of notes, but then I didn't internalize it as well as I wanted to. And so I got taught the 30 second habit. At the end of anything, try it after this talk, the end of any self-investment or learning, take 30 seconds and boil down everything you've heard into a few key things that you wanna take away the most important things, not everything. The, the mental process of tearing it apart, weighing the different pieces and assigning value to you, to them, drastically increases your retention. It makes you evaluate whether you agreed with what you heard or not. And it allows you to take those summary points and those are consumable, those can change behavior Whereas four pages of notes won't change behavior as effectively because you can't hold all that context in your head. After learning and self-investment, are you writing and speaking? Whether that's a journal or a blog or you know, a YouTube channel, even if you end up throwing those things away, it helps you craft your voice let you find a lot of your opinions, weigh things out. I actually deal with kind of emotionally heavy things through journaling. Um, I've got a PowerPoint template that was given to me by one of my, my dear friends and mentors. And when I've got a, you know, something I've done wrong or an emotionally tense conversation coming up, I dig into those. I write it out. What am I thinking? What am I feeling? What do I want? What did I do? You know, what did that cost me? Because oftentimes I'm talking about my mistakes. What am I going to do better next time? Are you finding that voice? Are you exploring those concepts so that you can say, this is what I think, this is my opinion, or is it just regurgitation of the opinions that you've heard from the people around you? That's an important piece in growing that skill set is it allows you to hold a concept without agreeing to it, evaluate it, and choose. And that choice is incredibly impactful, especially when somebody goes, hey, you should learn Node or hey, you should get your PMP. I fell on this very early in my career. I was like, oh, OK, I should get my PMP or oh, OK, I should learn Java. Uh, and so I would chase all of these things based on what somebody had told me without really evaluating it. And by writing it down and journaling and blogging through a lot of this, I realized that I didn't enjoy Java and I didn't really enjoy the PMP uh, because the projects I were working on were much more kind of research and, and development driven and Agile just fit better for me. And so finding that out, it allowed me to value those opinions without obeying those opinions. Which leads me to the next one of being able to keep yourself in a centered place. Now, I hear all sorts of things around impatience and millennials simon sinek rather famously said it's like they're standing at the bottom of a mountain and they see what they want at the top what they don't see is the mountain patience is an important career skill an incredibly important career skill i know of a bunch of folks who leapt out of a company into another role or jumped from position to position chasing a title or chasing you know direct reports or another thousand dollars a year and ultimately 
they could have made it objectively further had they been slightly more patient. Getting your getting yourself in the right space. And sometimes that takes a lot of effort. For me, that takes some meditation. Sitting down and just spending that quiet few minutes before rushing to a decision helps to instill that because patience is an incredibly valuable career skill. I'm not talking about spending 15 years in a dead end job, but did I think about, all right, so I joined this company two months ago and it's really not for me. Do I just bail or do I try and make it better? Right? What's it gonna look like to the next employer? What's it gonna look like to the next recruiter? Did I really weigh those in when I just got frustrated and said I quit? Now, all of these things we've talked about from time and attention management, communication, collaboration, learning, self-investment, writing, speaking, meditation, patience, they're all hard. They're all very difficult to do. So you have to create a habit of creating habits. Now, the, the approach I use for this is out of a book called Mini Habits, M-I-N-I -I Habits. Um, it's a fantastic book. And it talks about breaking down the barriers to starting something new by making the steps wicked small and easy to do. And for me, it's made all the difference. Everything from starting working out by just doing push-ups and sit-ups to wanting to learn a new skill. And so I just start and I build something with it. Um, my wife and I did this with woodworking and we built a table. And then as soon as we were done, we realized we wanted to build it differently. And so now we're 30 some odd pieces of furniture later, really enjoying that practice, all because we created really tiny steps to get us down that path. So are you creating the habits that are gonna power the career that you want in a time in which it's not gonna be handed to you and laid out the way it previously would have? There's not a kind of standard approach to career management any longer. It's much more fractured and much more self-driven. You're often not given a career. You find it or you build it. And so are you prepared for that shift of ownership? It's ultimately a question that I had to ask myself and then do a lot of work to make sure that I, I truly owned my own career. So now I'm going to pause here, see if we've got any questions from the audience before we move into the organizational impact and the kind of professional impact of digital and agile adoptions. Thank you, Devlin. Thank you, Devlin. I, do I do have a few, have questions, a few questions for you. For you. The, first the first question, question is, is our, our project, project managers, managers feel moving to a scrum master role is detrimental to their careers? because the path from PM to program manager to portfolio manager is not there. What is the best way to convince them it is not a dead end? So there's a couple of pieces to this, but the, the first rather glib answer holds a lot of truth to it. Make sure it's not a dead end, right? Program management, portfolio and program management still have a great place in agile organizations, right? The scrum guide doesn't talk about a lot of things that are organizational outside of the team and how work is funneled to that team, right? You start getting multiple teams, you start getting multi-year programs, building suites of products. Those skill sets are still incredibly valuable. Talking about how the skills they've spent a decade or two building translate into success and what a future might look like is incredibly important when making that transition easy for someone to move forward. We're actually going to be digging into it quite a bit here in just a little bit with the organizational impact because it's incumbent upon us as leaders and as an organized as an organization to paint those futures as potential that people can buy in and they can see themselves living into. Our next question is, has a failure or an apparent failure set you up later for success? Do you have a favorite failure of yours? So my favorite failure, um, I had never been a consultant before and I joined Improving um, and I got punted off of my first client. 
for an egregious set of failures. And it wasn't one, it was a series of probably 15 or 20 failures in my first three weeks. I stepped on all the landmines and I look back on it and it was it was transformational for me. I was terrified that I was going to be losing my job. And I sat down with the VP. He said, hey, don't go to the office. Come meet me for breakfast. And I was petrified. He goes, here's here's where you failed. Like, here's the results. You've been removed from the client. You're going to be on the bench. What are you going to do about it? So I went back to the office and I journaled out and I wrote down all the places where I felt I'd failed. I shared them with the team that I was working with. I was like, hey, don't fall into these pitfalls. And then I worked to close the gaps that I recognized I had out of that list with a bunch of mentorship that was offered freely to me, even though my first interaction with the company was failure. And I look at that and it truly was a formative moment for me because it forced me to to take ownership had i had i met that conversation with defensiveness or resentment oh they didn't you know they didn't believe in me they didn't support me i probably would have gotten fired i met it with yeah here's the parts of that failure i have to own and here's what i'm going to do to make sure they don't happen again and my career's never been the same since and continuing to have that ownership has led me to leading improving Houston when I started with us a decade ago as a senior consultant who got kicked off their first project. A third question I have, Devlin, is what additional reading material would you recommend a further digging into your personal growth? So I've got a laundry list of books that I absolutely love. Um, interestingly enough, I've put that list together very recently as kind of an extracurricular, an extracurricular syllabus for my nephew who's in college. And so um, I will update the description on, on the schedule application with the reading list at the bottom of it um, by tomorrow when we post the video out onto Sketch. Um, but there's a, there's a pretty big laundry list. Most of them focus around self-awareness and how to get yourself to motivate the change right the human mind as a as a change agent thank you that's all the questions for right now awesome so let's move on into that organizational impact right what's this going to look like when we start changing the way people interact with our organizations from reporting structures and hierarchies to you know, where does accountability live? Those kind of questions. Now, currently out there, you've got a bunch of different opinions. You've got the traditional kind of organization. It's hierarchical. Typically, your level in an organization can be relayed by the number of people who report to you that you're responsible for. There's nothing wrong with this organizational structure. And when you've got highly skilled managers and leaders, can be incredibly effective. But it also creates scarcity in the roles and positions as growth evolves to that, you know, program manager, portfolio manager type uh, question of how do I continue to progress up the up the pyramid? You have the tribal model, right, where you have different groups that are coordinated by, let's call them products or business divisions or value streams whatever. And then you've got these horizontal skills, you know, centers of excellence, those kind of things. Um, and this has a lot less hierarchy. But the people that are in this model still want career growth, right? What does developer to developer lead to architect really look like? So the tribal model tears down some of the problems from that, that traditional uh, organization, but it creates some additional problems that have to be dealt with. And then there's the Spotify model, right? And all the different variants of this thing. You've got loosely connected but tightly aligned tribes, which is much, much easier to say than it is to do. Even they recognize that. Um, 
But with all these different competing models, it's very similar to the competing project management methodologies of the process wars. Do we do agile? Do we do lean? Do we do, you know, CMMI? Do we do uh, waterfall? All of these different pieces, because there's so much out there right now and there's no clear like this is the best for this situation. What you should read away from that is change is coming. Right, the way that we organize ourselves, whether it's complex adaptive systems or traditional hierarchy or tribes, is going to change the way we interact with each other. It's going to change the way people envision their career because the career they envisioned five years ago is no longer the reality they're living in today. And so with all change, we create fear, uncertainty, doubt, or we alleviate those depending on how we show up as an organization and as leaders. So I want to spend some time talking about the, tr the truths that we can hold to as a leader, whether that is cultural leaders that don't have formal position or whether that's organizational leaders that are responsible for making those hard decisions. These are some of those truths that we should hold on to as we evaluate an agile adoption or a digital transformation or even how do we continue to progress one that may have stagnated or make sure that the one that's going really well keeps going down the track correctly. With more choice comes less action, right? There's a great HBR article, the links in the slide deck that will get uh, posted after this. More isn't always better. Um, when we tell people inside our organization that with this new model, they could be anything from product owner to agile coach to scrum master to team member to tribe leader and on and on and on. We're oftentimes removing the safety blanket of knowing what their next career step was and we're not replacing it with guidance. I've seen agile adoption after agile adoption fail because nobody properly addressed what the future of the middle management looked like. And that middle management layer is not waste. It's there for a purpose, and unless we can give it a future, it may be different, but unless we can paint a future, it becomes a big roadblock to substantive change. Now we can help with this in learning paths, right? If I'm coming out from a project manager and I'm going to be a scrum master, all right, so what's the learning path to gain the skills to be an effective scrum master? And does that remove the fear that I'm going to be left behind, that my skill set is no longer valued by the organization that I'm dedicated to? Right? Do we create example career transition paths of as a project manager, here are the different ways you could evolve from scrum master to agile coach and more kind of uh, Sherpa type behavior? Or you could go from project manager, scrum master, and then into product owner, and really help to shape and craft the next generation of products for the company. So we remove the uncertainty. If we say you can be anything, all of the onus is on the person hearing that. Now it's much easier to say that, but it, it causes a lot of angst. And then explicitly recognizing that what an agile transformation means or a digital transformation means regarding the jobs that aren't listed in the Agile Manifesto, that aren't in the Scrum Guide, it can remove the doubt about whether I have a future. So many times I'll be talking to teams and they're like, so I don't see where I fit into the team because I'm a UX designer and the Scrum Guide just calls everybody developers. I'm not a developer. Do I fit? Yes, you contribute and here's how you contribute. Simply painting that future with a very broad brush can alleviate a lot of that fear and uncertainty. Another truth to hold to, perception is real even if it's not reality. If I feel trapped or devalued and I don't see a career path for me, even if there's one there, Telling me I'm wrong probably isn't the best way to get me to become a champion of this change, to get me to not stand in the way of the change. So, give you an example that came up in one of our internal discussions. 
if I tell you something that at the time, based on the information I have, is my read on a situation, and then something changes and it turns out that what I thought was going to happen didn't happen, did I lie? I don't think so. However, does that mean I get to dismiss the feedback when somebody goes, hey, I felt lied to when you said this, but something else happened? I don't think so either. I don't get to dismiss that perception because it didn't match my reality, my perception of reality. Understanding it, explaining it, coming to it with empathy for the people who we are changing their world, whether that is into remote working where we're going to ask them to do some things that they may or may not be comfortable with, like turning on video from home. Some people are very uncomfortable with that, right? To, hey, I've just removed the entire title of program manager and you were one year away from making that your next career move. What's the future look like for you? Recognizing that the perceptions of being left behind, being kind of bottled in to one role are real and need to be dealt with, even if they're not based on reality. As a leader, that's a very hard thing to do. Another truth to hold to, especially with agile adoptions. So this is one of the slides we use to communicate about agile adoptions and improving is, are we talking too much about tomorrow rather than today? Because the hope, the goal, the kind of utopia that we all aim for with an agile adoption is to get to self-managing teams, a culture that perpetuates always getting better or as we call it always improving yes the puns never end those kinds of things are where we're aiming for but just like you don't teach a kid to ride a bike by taking off all of the training wheels and just saying go we actually start pretty prescriptive right obey the scrum framework or the kanban framework or whichever you've chosen you know Take the advice of a coach, try it, even when it's uncomfortable, do it for a while. Because just like, you know, learning to play a new sport or build a new skill, there's going to be growth, there's going to be pain, there's going to be discomfort. We have to start kind of in that tactical coaching and training and being very prescriptive. But then there's an inflection point in the adoption. And at that inflection point, you know, we've grown a little bit of leadership understanding, a little bit of business understanding, and we've grown a little bit of team understanding probably across multiple pilot teams. There's a transition at that point to start growing the, the commonalities, the centers of pra uh, communities of practice, centers of excellence, um, educating more and more of the business, changing our leadership models, maybe even adjusting career paths and compensation models at that point. If we approach that middle phase where we're in this continuous improvement cycle of incremental change with the same tools that we approach the beginning of it with, we're gonna make a lot harder on ourselves because the tactical highly prescriptive falls down. People start understanding the whys and hows and they wanna experiment without fear of failure, but if it's super prescriptive, they can't do that and actually start thinking, well, the, that's the framework. Agile is prescriptive, it's constraining, it's not empowering, right? The same way as if we start too far on the right-hand side in that self-determination, we can end up with a bad adoption. If we carry the left-hand side too far through the adoption, we can do the same. And ultimately, we're gonna have to do, as leaders, more and harder work, but we'll probably get better results and ourselves included, happier people. What do I mean by this? Changing culture, changing process, and moving people's cheese is hard. Now, I could simply from the top, from the top say, we're gonna go agile next year. Pretty easy to make that statement. Is it actually easy to change an entire organization in a year? Nope. And so you get this kind of cultural built-in response to big sweeping change in most organizations. 
Now, the response in some organizations is awesome. This is our next step. And then in others, it's oh, this is just the latest fad. Wait two years, it'll pass. So we're going to have to do the hard work. We're going to have to live the values as leaders that we want demonstrated by our people. That means if we're in the middle of an agile adoption or a digital transformation, we're probably going to have to stop measuring, compensating, and bonusing on on time and on budget and have to pivot it to business value delivered, revenue differentials, making them business metrics rather than activity metrics. That's a lot harder. It takes a lot more cultural change, but we end up happier with the outcomes. So we need to walk through this with folks, right? There's going to be the shock of, oh dear, something's changed and the anxiety that that comes into. Then, OK, I, I think I understand the change. I'm still a little queasy about it, right? And then the, there's the folks who have found a little success and they're like, awesome, I understand how to do it. Hey, you're doing it wrong. And they start using this new process that's meant to empower as a bludgeon to get people to do it the same way, even though teams are different. And then you get those champions, those success stories, the spotlights. And then it's back to the new norm. And this will happen on every team, every division, for every person at different paces. And so there's a lot more empathy that goes into leading through that because the one size fits all answers typically don't function very well. So as leaders, we want to make sure that we're walking this, this journey with them and that we're evolving our organization to remove as much anxiety, fear, uncertainty, and doubt as possible. With that, are there any questions around the organizational change and how that might play out? Devlin, I have Devlin, several, I have several questions, questions for you. For you. As a, As a leader in a company, in a company how can how someone can help inspire and create a mindset that drives and cultivates the behaviors to make other realize their potential, stay engaged and progress in their careers? It's a great question. Um, I can I can tell you how we've done it um, and I can tell you the, the places I've seen this done very well um, all seem to have a common thread. It's looking for the win win scenarios. Right? It's not I'm working to make my boss look good. Right? It's knowing that if I put in the extra effort, it's going to be recognized because it's valuable. Um, it's in spending the extra time when somebody asks a question to explain. Right? One of the reasons that improving often shares our financials internally and then teaches people how to read corporate finances is so that we can have a meaningful conversation about their impacts to the business, right? In, we sum it up by saying thinking more of others without thinking less of yourself. You don't have to be selfless to invest in another person. They can win and you can win and there's no judgment in that. So being otherish, other ish, which is a, a great quote from Give and Take, um, great book, it's part of the book list. Um, I find that that's at its crux, the big pivot point in simply being willing to invest and give freely of your time, knowledge, and experience to others. Our next question is, I love the shift from PM to Scrum Master because I enjoyed working with the team and learning new ways of working. I also enjoyed developing the team rather than focusing on directing them to deliver on time and on budget. But this shift is not for everyone. How do companies select the right people to make that shift or have them self direct the role in a way that is a transformational environment? It's a tough one. Um, I will say that oftentimes our interviewing, hiring and HR processes are not set up to put the right people in the right roles. Uh, they're set up to make sure that we have the skills that I'm good with Word and Microsoft Project and I've used Azure DevOps and I'm good at Gantt charts and Excel. It doesn't necessarily say. Am I good at coaching and changing the behavior and culture of others? Right. 
a scrum master is not somebody that makes sure the team checks all the boxes. If I'm looking for skills, they're much softer skills and they're typically harder to find. Now, when you go looking for them or intentionally growing them, you get that transformational environment. You get the scrum masters don't have to show up the same. They're measured on outcomes, not activity. And so if if you as a scrum master, you find that a supportive role that's less driving, but helping the team to experiment and then survive its own mistakes as it learns and grows, if you're getting similar outcomes to somebody who is that that transformational, they educate, they step back, you know, and really coach from the back or coach from the sidelines and you're getting similar results, those are both effective models for being a scrum master. Um, what I have found is an attentive and engaged leader is one of the biggest stop gaps if you've made a mistake you can possibly have. Having somebody that goes, hey, so I noticed that you were still leading your scrums, but you've been in there for you know two and a half, three months. Is it possible to step back and let like the team leader, let somebody else kind of lead that meeting because the role of a scrum master is not to lead those meetings, but to empower the team to execute the process. And so having somebody that notices those things and is willing to have those coaching conversations makes a big difference. The other one is when you're writing the job description, when you're trying to find the person, talking about the attributes you want from them, not the skills you want from them. Skills can be taught, right? We want somebody who's empathetic who's good at active listening, right? We want somebody that honestly cares about the success of others and can celebrate it. That's a very different job description than we want somebody with five years of Scrum experience. Devlin, do you have any guidance for when management and leadership say they are 100% on board with Agile, but their mindsets don't seem to actually shift? It sometimes feels like our version of Agile is only a new suite of digital tools, but we're still working in traditional mindsets. What I have found is it's a it's a two directional problem. When I've run into leadership and IT or leadership and delivery being disconnected, feeling like they've got two different definitions of Agile, um, it's typically because they do, right? We typically talk about processing and tools and those kind of things without educating the leaders on here's what that's going to mean without aligning our compensation structures and our bonus structures to results delivery rather than activity delivery. Uh, at the same time, most of the IT teams I've ever worked with, if I ask them, hey, what's the revenue difference this feature is going to cause in our product, couldn't answer it. Um, and so it's it's a little bit of us speaking two different languages, right? They're looking at the business metrics and trying to map that to the, the agility processes. Even though agility focuses on those business metrics and IT is focused on the agility metrics and trying to map them back over through portfolio management or something else to business initiatives. If we remove that translation layer, through education and collaboration, I found it's far more effective. And I honestly think that when leaders say we're 100% on board, it's because they're on board with the change that it would mean to the culture, but they've never done it either, right? They may not have done it you know, at all. They may have done it at a different organization, but come into a different culture and don't know how to change it. And so working collaboratively to line up those business results with how you're going to measure IT is a huge part of it, right? How are we going to measure success as a delivery group can't be about its velocity. It's got to be about the impact it's going to have for customers, the impact it's going to have on the P&L, because ultimately we're all trying to move in the same direction. We're just measuring it differently, and that causes some pretty bad side effects. Thank you, Devlin. I believe we're out of time for today. Thank you, everybody. The video for this will be up um, along with the vast majority of the videos for the rest of these the day after the talk. 
Um, so I encourage you take a look back out at the sketch site and look at the schedule, see if you can make them. And even if there's one that you want to make, but you got a conflicting meeting, go ahead and add that one to your calendar. And so when you get the reminder, you'll see that video. Thank you for taking some time out of your afternoon. Have a great evening and enjoy the rest of Agile Shift.